Y puro H-Town, Houston, Texas. The IBO lightweight champion of the world, Juan Baby Boy. From 2019 to 20, uh, to 2022, we grew from 30 trucks to 70 trucks mm -hmm. because some of these drivers started to see that the only drivers out on the road were container guys. All right, all right, all right, Hustle Fam, Hustle Fam. We are back with another amazing episode. And today I have a very, very special guest. I'm here on location with the champ. The champ is here. The champ is here. <laughs> what's going on, my brother Juan, baby bull Diaz? What's hey, up, my man? What's going on, my brother? Hey, good to meet you. It's a pleasure to meet you in person. We met each other through phone, but yeah. it's a pleasure to have you here in H Town, Texas. H -Town. You know, we're in a sweat box right now. <laughs> Sorry about that, but Listen, you know, we, we gotta do it. We're, man. we're we literally, we're literally in the ring. You know what I mean? We sweating, but we this is what we do to 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 get the aesthetic. You know what I'm saying? There we got we had to get the aesthetic and get the feel, man. What you built here is amazing. You just now took me on a tour of the facility and, you know, we'll get some shots of that. Um, everything you got going on. Um, you guys got 70 trucks into modal. You're doing a whole lot of big things, but we're going to get into all that. <laughs> but first, we have to get into the story, how you got into the trucking business. So first, I want to welcome you to Truck and Hustle, man. Welcome to the show. Appreciate it, man. Thank you very much, uh, Romel, for having me here. It's a pleasure, man. I'm I'm very excited. Once I uh, I follow you, so I'm a, I'm a I'm a fan myself. So I appreciate the invite. I appreciate you flying down here and taking the time to uh, share my story with with your public and with the world, basically. Because you know the trucking industry has been it's a it's a hot commodity right now these days. So so <laughs> thank you, thank you, man, for having me here. No doubt, no doubt. So we're gonna talk about the road to becoming a world champion, and then we're gonna. To talk about the road to becoming a trucking champion. All oh, right, there you go. All right, so let's get it. Let's start from the beginning. Where, where are you from, man? Let's talk a little bit about your, you know, wh where, where are you from? Talk, talk about it. All right, so I was born and raised here in uh, Houston, Texas. Uh, my parents are from Mexico. So, uh, man, th 40 years ago, you know, I'm 38, but 40 years ago, my parents decided to take that that uh, leap of faith and come here to the United States and uh, start a better a better uh, life for uh, for my brother and myself. So I only have one sibling, uh, my younger brother Jose, who's uh, we'll get into that a little bit later. Yeah. And, but he's my uh, chugging business partner, and uh, but yeah, 40 years ago they came to the United States. And believe it or not, man, they come from the same city, the same town, but they didn't even know each other. Oh, you wow. Know? They didn't even know each other. They so they just, both came to the U.S. and met here. Yeah, they met oh, here, wow. man. It's, it's interesting. It was like there were when they found out. um they were only like 10 minutes apart from each other, man. They lived like 10 minutes apart from each other. Well, where, where'd they meet here? In Houston. Okay, In so Houston. What, were they like working together or how'd no, they meet? Man, they, they got here, you know how uh, they had to cross the border and all, on all that stuff, man. Yeah. They, so they crossed the elite. Like a, like a real movie, huh? Yeah, yeah, like a real movie, man, <laughs> through, through, the, through the river and everything. You know, so at that time, it was bad, but it's not as bad as it is now, okay. right? Which... Uh, you know, they came to to get a better life for for themselves, and uh, they crossed here. So then, uh, when they got here, uh, they were actually living in the same uh little little shack, man. And it, I wouldn't even call it a house; it's a little shack of fifteen people. You know, and they brought them here. It's like they, a safe house or something like they, that. Exactly, okay. exactly. So they started working, and. Um, they were living in the same house, but they didn't even know each other. They they had no communication with each other. Okay. So even then, they didn't even get to uh, meet each other there. They met each other at the plant where they started working. Okay. So, so it's interesting, man. That's it, super interesting. It is, man. So they, they, this is like meant to be pretty much, it man. It was meant to be, man. They lived in the same town. They were living in the same little uh, shack or safe house. You, I guess is a lack of a better term, right? And they ended up meeting at, uh, uh, it was some kind of company where they uh, ma machine they built machines or or car parts or something like that so 
uh, they started working there and they actually ended up meeting them in the lunchroom. <laughs> so okay. that's, they had lunch, you know, and my dad said, hey, man, who's that Who's that cute little mama? <laughs> yeah. Not, I don't yeah, know if he yeah, said yeah, that, you know. That's, but, that's, what he, that's yeah, probably what he said, that's though. That's probably what he said, you know. <laughs> All right, cool. So, uh, uh, so, so two years later, you're born. Man, yeah, they, they met and the minute they met, man, it was, they locked eyes and it was love Fireworks. at first sight, man. Love at first sight. So then uh, they uh, started dating and they dated for a, a, a year. They got married, and then boom, man! As soon as they got married, my mom got pregnant, and here, here I go, man. The okay. firstborn, you know. After after two years, um, Juan, baby boy Diaz was born. There you, you know, go. The future, future, uh, former four time world champion <laughs> was born. Yeah, you know? but it's interesting because my father, the minute I was born. He said, well, not even I was born, man. When I was in my mother's uh, stomach with the womb, he said, if we have a boy, he's going to be a world champion. He's really? going to be a boxer and he's going to be a world champion. Okay. So he actually prophesied what I was going to do before I was even born. Now, man. why though? Did your father box? He did. Okay. In, in Mexico, he boxed. He, uh, he, he went to local gyms in Mexico and he used to train. And he decided to get in into the the ring and spar, and he said, "Man, I only spar one time. I went in there against a smaller guy than me. He whooped my butt <laughs> so bad it made me quit. So okay. he quit, and he's like, he's just like, I'm just gonna go to work. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> got you, got you. All right, cool. So, um, like you said, two years later, you're born. W what part of Houston are you guys in at this time? We're uh, actually what we've, area we've always uh, my parents have always been around South Houston. Okay, so the the two eighty eight uh, Amida Genoa side, like going going south of Houston. You know, if you keep going south on two eighty eight, or you go south Houston, you end up in the in the Gulf, right? Okay, and you can't go no further no further out. So we've always been in in South Houston, uh, born and raised, grew up. So. You know, my, my parents, they uh they finally moved out of the, the safe house once they got married. They uh they got their own little place with uh with my uncles, my aunts and uncles. So at, at one point uh they moved out from strangers and uh they had my my other family members, which are my aunts and uncles who came here from Mexico as well, and they basically rented a, a mobile home in which we had about three families so it was my uncle with his family and my aunt with his family and then my my mom and dad with his family so okay they had to make ends meet 100 percent, 100 percent. all right so so tell me about your childhood man obviously it was a little crowded in, in, <laughs> yeah. you know to, but, yeah. but how was it coming up man it was it was pretty good you know we we speed up uh, uh about eight years from when i was born and uh, we're still living in the mobile home. This eight-year-old boy who weighs about 120 pounds, <laughs> you know, just all kinds of trouble, man. I, right. like, I beat up kids at school. They used to call me names. I push them down, sit on them. <laughs> you know, I, I, they, call my, they call my parents, man. They call my parents. They're like, hey, come pick up, come pick up your, your son. You know, he just beat up another kid. Oh, so, wow. So I'm, I guess I know what it is to be bullied and then bully people because I started getting bullied. You know, kids would come and poke me in the stomach. They're like, woohoo. You remember the Pillsbury Doughboy? Like, woohoo. You, you were a little chunky. Yeah, I was, man. I mean, think about it. You're eight years old. You weigh 120, 120 pounds, pounds, man. Right, that's, right, right. That's, a, that's a big boy, man. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. a big boy right there. So um, I used to get bullied a lot and then I, I got tired of it. So I started fighting back. So that's when I started pushing kids to the ground, sitting on them, making them cry. And uh, they call my, my parents up and parents pick me up from school. And, you know, until finally one day, my father found the, the, uh, the boxing gym. He's like, he told my mom, look, I told you he's going to be a boxer and he's going to be a world champion. And I found the gym. Mm. And this is where he found uh, the Savannah Boxing Club. Okay. And that's where my whole life changed everything changed man that's where i met mr willie savannah the late and great willie savannah he passed away last year um he taught me everything i know man because my parents had limits you know they're they came from mexico with no education all they knew was just hard work 
they had two jobs. You know, at a time I used to, my mom would wake wake up in the morning, her tonsils were swollen, fever, but she still managed to wake my brother and myself up and get us ready for school, have my dad drop us off and she'll go to work. You know, so so her, it was both of them. You know, all they knew was hard work, hard work. But when I stepped into that boxing that boxing gym is when my life changed. And I say my life changed because my, um, I guess everything opened up. The world opened up to me mm. because with my parents, I was limited to what they know, which is working hard, you know, getting a job and going to school, getting a good education. And that's it. You know, now I'm starting to sound like rich that poor dad. You know? <laughs> You're like, you know, your parents teach you to go to school, right, right, right. Get, get a good job. Right. And so, you know, that's all they knew. They were like, you need to go to school, get a good job, uh, you know, get your family and this and that, whatever, you know. But then Mr. Willie Savannah taught me. He started to show my brother and myself. He started to open our eyes to the world. Mm. And by when I say open our eyes to the world is... We started boxing. We started going to all these national tournaments all over the country. Man, we fought in, in Florida, Kansas, California, um, everywhere, New York. We fought all over the country. So then we started to see places that we've never thought we would ever see or we didn't even know they existed. Right. You know, so uh, through boxing, I've learned, I learned a lot through Mr. Willie Savannah and boxing. Uh, my eyes were open. I got to see the world. I got to see that it, it's not just Houston, Texas. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. know where I'm meant to be or or I'm meant to stay. So then, through boxing, I uh, I learned all of that. Now, keep in mind, I had to get good grades in <laughs> order to to travel and go to all these boxing events. So right. I now you had a reason to I had, to I had excel reason, in school and exactly, do better. Exactly, exactly. So then, you know, we. I started doing real good um, in boxing. And, what age uh, did you start? What age was it eight, when you eight you, you years started old. at eight? You said eight years old. Now, now, real quick, were you were you a natural boxer, or or were, did you have to get kind of taught? Like, did you have to get your skills refined, or did you already already kind of have some skills already? No skills whatsoever. Okay, man. all all, all it, you know when a kid steps in the ring and you know if he has it or he doesn't is you look at this the heart. And the cojones, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Honestly, That's it. That's I mean, it. Not, not literally look at them, right? But you see it in the ring. When they step in the ring and they got that aggressiveness. They got that, you know, if the kid gets hit and he's he doesn't back down. He's like, no, I want some more. Then you know he has it. Well, uh, I had that. You had that. I had that. Okay. You know, when they punch me, like, they'll make me cry. I'll be crying in the ring, man. And then my father and mother would come up to me and they're like hey what's wrong nothing <laughs> nothing I, I got something in my eye you know <laughs> that's it that's, you know right. I, I never i never back down where'd you get that from man i i i got that from from both my my father and mother man okay because you know and like i said they've been through so much uh and when i say so much they had to struggle to get to where they're at you know they had to fight for every pin and penny nickel and dime that they have they came here uh, illegally they crossed they they were treated like trash man they lived uh in a safe home with 10 other people they had to work hard to get what they have now right so you know i'm so grateful man for for the opportunity that that my parents they took that chance to come here to the to the u.s to this great country of the u.s and then i met mr savannah and I was able to um, learn the skill of boxing. So, you know, I knew I had it because I had that anger, that hunger that my father and mother gave me as I was coming up. So you said you, you start boxing, you start traveling all over the world. So you're, you're competing at a very young age, right. right? So he's just taking you around to see different events. So you're, you're actually out there competing I'm, at this point. I'm actually competing, man. I'm competing. I'm, uh, I started boxing when I was eight. And because I was such a, a big boy, at the age of eight, I had one fight the whole year. Because there was nobody really <laughs> nobody, my, my nobody age. Your age in yeah. way, okay. Yeah. So when I was nine, I, I had my second fight. Throughout the whole year, I only had one fight. Okay. So it was my second fight. 
And then at 10, I started to get a little taller and lose some weight. So then I started fighting, fighting, fighting. And at the age of 13, I won my first national title. Uh, I started here in Houston. Then I fought, this is the city, then state, then regional and national. And I won the my first uh, national silver gloves at the, at the age of uh, 12 or 13. I don't remember what it was, right? Okay. And then after that, man, it's just, it seems like everything just... Fast forward, like it went from zero to a hundred real quick. You know? <laughs> right, right, right. I, I, uh, I, I can't even tell you fight for fight, but I went from the age of twelve or thirteen to sixteen, and I already had a hundred and five amateur fights. Damn, a hundred and five, a hundred and five fights. Uh, yeah, hundred before five. you were sixteen years yep, old. Yep. So, so then, and I lost five. Okay. I only lost five. Only five, man. Because in amateur, you know, you win one week, you lose the next. Right. You win two or three, then you lose two or three. You know, that's just the way amateur is. But I had 105 amateur fights and lost five. So then at the age of 16, I was just dominating, man. I had 13 gold medals uh, in these national tournaments. I, I had went overseas to or across the country to mexico i fought in national tournaments down there i went to puerto rico and fought in tournaments down there and i beat every kid in my weight division my age right so then that's where uh mr willie savannah said you know what let's try for the olympics and i was only 16 i that wasn't even on my mind because you have to be 17 okay in order to fight in the olympics okay so Fighting for the U.S. in the 2000 Olympics was a definitely no, because at the time they uh, I was only 16, and then they had Miguel Cotto, who uh, was he's a great boxer. They had him in my weight. Well, I was in his weight division. Okay, in Puerto Rico. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, and then they had um, what's this guy? Uh, it was another guy, Ricardo Williams. Ricardo Williams. Okay, who was the number one pound for pound boxer that the U.S. had, he was in the lightweight division, which was the division that I was in. Right. So the U.S. and Puerto Rico said no, you know, definitely no. So we went down to Mexico, man, because my parents are from Mexico. Yeah. You know? So yeah. I'm basically a, a Mexican national when I'm down there uh, because of my parents. So I went down there. I competed in a few open tournaments and I beat all the guys there, man. How so, old are these guys? Your age or older? No, man. I was 16. They were in their 20s, oh, 30s. <laughs> wow, you know, that's so. crazy. GTT Commercial Tires is a tire store that's designed with the owner-operator in mind. It serves as a helpful community where you are always their number one priority. Whether you're a new owner-operator or you've been driving for years, their mission is the same, to keep owner-operators in business. That's why they go above and beyond providing superior customer service when you actually need it, educating you on proper tire care and delivering a no BS sales experience. With two conveniently located stores in Richmond and Petersburg, Virginia, and almost 2,000 five-star Google reviews, they are truly raising the bar and setting a new standard in tire care. Make sure you call 1-800-991-6251 to schedule your appointment now and tell them Truck & Hustle sent you. So then uh, we go down there with the hopes that maybe Mexico will take me. So they're like, heck yeah, man, we'll take you. So I started beating all these guys, these grown men. Now, granted, grown men, I'm only 16 years old. Yeah. So uh, I start beating them. Mexico says, you know what? We're going we're gonna to try to fight for you to go and represent us in the 2000 Olympics. Well, man, I had won all these tournaments to make it, to get a shot at the Mexican Olympic team, right? To beat, to go represent Mexico. But when it came, when it came time to go, um, again, the U.S. and Puerto Rico, they, they said, what is this kid doing here? He's not even 17. Right. So they protested, man. We had out of 20 countries, I think, that okayed me, uh, the U.S. and Puerto Rico protested. They said, nope. So all they needed is one country to say no, and that was gonna, <laughs> oh, that was wow. gonna do it. So then, you know, that was it, man. So my dreams were crushed. I was like, well, I mean, they were they were not really crushed, but right. I was sad. It was man. a setback. Yeah, it was a setback. You know, I wasn't expecting to go to the Olympics, but when the time came and the opportunity presented itself, I was like, man, this is gonna be good. You know, 
Well, anyways, in 2000, man, I saw Miguel Cotto go and fight, Ricardo Williams go and fight. I think they, they both got a silver medal. They came out and they got like a $2 million signing bonus, you know, and they, they went on and became uh, world champions and became pros. Well, they came out and they had, to, they had a $2 million signing bonus, right? I, because I didn't get to go to the Olympics and I was still 16, <laughs> I couldn't turn pro here in the U.S. So I went back to Mexico and I turned pro in Mexico at the age of 16. Okay. So <laughs> I, had, I had three fights, man, as a pro. That's crazy. Three fights as a pro. You know how much I got? In how my much? first fight? How much? Four hundred dollars. Four hundred dollars to fight a four round fight when, you know, these guys got like a two million dollar signing bonus. Wow. So I had And you're still to, fighting older guys, right? I'm still fighting older so, guys. So so being sixteen and being a pro, that's kinda like unheard of, right? It, it is. I mean, well, like I mean, it, like what you did, like did, is there anybody else who did a, walked a similar path, or is that did, like kind of you're the only one who did that no no man i mean it's 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 happened okay. before you know okay. they, they have kids man from these third world countries that are trying to make make a living for them and their families and i'm pretty sure there's quite a few uh boxers in mexico who have turned a pro at 15 man right. so you know so there's it's, no it's, there's it's, no regulations you could turn pro at any what age do you have to be well, to turn pro in mexico well, in mexico i think it's 15 15 if i'm not mistaken okay here in the u.s 17 17 you know so other countries i'm not sure you Got know, you. it might be 13 you know, so you, you, have, you have to find the loopholes right right, right. all right yeah so, so you, you you finally turned pro at 16 in mexico and you said you get 400 dollars for your first fight 400 dollars man. so how, how how does that feel because you're looking at <laughs> you know miguel Cotto and all these other guys they're getting millions so does that this, is that like is that a setback for you? Does that like or do you, do you like work harder? Like what? It's just motivation, man. Okay, motivation because you know if if I knew in in my in my heart in my mind I knew that I was just as good as him to be in there fighting with them, even though I was sixteen at the time, right? I knew that I I had the the strength, the power, and the will to be in there with them. So it just motivated me, man. It motivated me to work to keep working hard to try to show them prove to them what what i was at the time so man i, I had three fights down there in mexico for four hundred dollars you know on my fourth fight i turned 17 okay. i came down here to the u.s here to houston and i i had my pro debut in the u.s my fourth fight and i fought here and i got paid i think Eight hundred dollars for that fight. You know, eight hundred dollars for that. Okay, not so, two million yet. We get in nah, there. Nah, <laughs> nah, we get in there, man. We get it. But you know, I've and I, I think I learned from my parents, man, that they had to fight for everything they got. So it was just normal to me. You know, Juan. I said to myself, Juan, you have to work hard. You have to push yourself. You have to dedicate yourself to what you do in order to get what you want. You right. know, so I I just kept pushing hard, man. I kept pushing hard. And uh, because of I kept pushing hard, I finally got my break. You know, I, I'm, maybe I had uh, 10 fights here locally in Houston and Louisiana. And finally, I got a chance to to uh, main events is who they're actually from New Jersey, a company from New Jersey. Main okay. events, uh, they're a promotional company. And uh, they had uh, Lou Devella at the time um who's the the promoter right lou develops a famous promoter god rest his soul passed away too a few years ago but he gave me the chance to try to basically uh audition right for for his from for his promotional company okay so then you know in the 2000s other promoters had a lot of a lot of money to sign these these young fighters so then um I got a chance, man, and on my 10th fight, I think we went to Vegas, and uh, I got a chance to fight on ESPN, and um, I did really good, man. I, I knocked the guy out, I think, in the fourth or fifth round. I come back to the dressing room, and uh, instead of giving me the cash, they hand me an envelope. I'm like, I'm telling my, my manager and my, and my uh, coaches, hey, uh, where's my cash? Why did you give me an envelope? Right. And they're like, well, your money's in there. I'm like, what? I'm like, it's called a check. Yeah, exactly, exactly, man. So I open the envelope and I look, I pull out the check. I'm like, 
fifteen thousand dollars. I'm like, what the heck? I'm only seventeen years old, man. Fifteen <laughs> grand. I'm like, wow, man. Right. I call my mom. I'm like, mom, you don't gotta work no more. I got you. <laughs> we up. Uh, yeah, I'm like, we gonna, uh, mom. I got you. Yeah. I'm like you don't gotta worry about nothing. Yeah. And then she like. We'll talk when you get home, son. Right, right, <laughs> yeah. right. Don't, so, don't get too far ahead yeah, of yourself. Don't get too far ahead, man. So I'm like, I got the big head. I knocked this guy out, man. I'm like, Shh, man, I'm gonna make some money now. You For know? Sure. So, gonna- so, so, real quick. So, who's handling your business? Like these other fights that you're getting paid four hundred dollars. Like who, who's negotiating these these numbers for you? Well, my my manager is okay. My manager Willie Savannah, who who's that my same, the same manager. guy. Okay, he's yeah, negotiating yeah. that which, for you. Which you know, it's not. Out of the ordinary man for a, a young, basically I was a nobody. You had to prove yourself. Yeah, I was a nobody. You know, you some of these guys they went. Remember, I never fought in the open tournament. Meaning, the open tournament, seventeen and and older, never, because I never, I was sixteen. Right. You know, so I could never prove myself against these older fighters. Gotcha. And, and a lot of these professional boxers that are coming up that turn pro and they get thousands of dollars they've proven themselves they have over 200 fights they fought all the best fighters all over the world you know the furthest i went out was mexico and puerto rico right you know? so i i couldn't really prove myself so got you my manager didn't really have that much bargaining that much power. leverage yeah 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 to okay. to say hey i got a i got a hell of a kid here he's gonna be the next julio cesar chavez or whatever you know yeah. he didn't have that so i had to prove myself well then man i get the check and then i go on and fight a few more times by then i'm exciting the promoters uh showtime hbo they're looking at me well i go on and i think it's like my 17th fight man and, and by then i'm like 18 years old and i go down to a paso and uh by then i got a big head man i'm like you know come on man you're, I'm, I'm getting 10 15, he's knocking out everybody 15, yeah 10 15 thousand dollars man 17 yeah. years old i'm like man i'm i feel good you know i'm like at this rate i'm become a millionaire in no time yeah you know but but this is where i tell you this is the biggest I guess lesson that that I've learned in my life and it has stuck to me to this day, man. In my 17th fight, I um I go down to El Paso. I'm with main event. I'm fighting on Showtime. And uh I still remember the guy's name. I don't remember the whole fight, and I'm gonna tell you why, but I remember <laughs> the guy's name. You know, his name is Uvaldo Hernandez. Uh I was 18 years old, he was 26 at the time. A uh Mexican fighter, very dur- durable man. They put him in there just to give young fighters hell, you know, to test young fighters. So then we go in there to El Paso, and uh I'll go in there the first round. Man, I I dominate. I'm doing good, man. I'm like, man, I'm gonna knock this guy out in three or four rounds. So I got the big head, you know. I'm thinking, man, I'm gonna knock this guy out. I, I'm, a, I'm gonna make some good money. And uh, so then the second round goes. We're punching, punching. I go straight right hand. I hit. Uh, I throw hook and I pull back, and he catches me with a hook, and boom, I fall to the ground, man. After that second round. You know where I woke up? The next time I woke up, <laughs> I woke up in the dressing room. My strength and conditioning woke up coach. In the dressing room. Wow. My strength and conditioning coach was taking off my shoes. He said, I was like, Brian, his name's Brian. Brian, what happened? What happened, man? He's like, You won the fight. You're good. I'm like, what? I'm like, what? What's going on? So what happened, man? He hit me so hard, I blacked out. But I blacked out, but my body kept fighting, kept what? reacting, man. Are yeah. you serious? Yep. I'm dead. And you serious. still won the fight. And I won the fight. On points. On points. You know? <laughs> but, but you don't remember, you don't I remember, remember fighting. Remember, to this that, day, man, to this crazy. day, I do not remember finishing the fight, man. <laughs> it's insane. Wow. You, you know? But then, I'm telling you, that, that day taught me valuable lessons because... I was 18. I had already started college at, at the University of Houston, right? And and I was just going only because I was listening to my mother. She kept nagging me, stay in school, and this and that. And I'm like, all right, well, I'm gonna listen to my mom. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna give it another year or so, and then I'm I'm just gonna quit. I'm gonna stop. Right. I'm gonna stop going to school because I'm gonna be a millionaire pretty soon. Right. Well, hell, man, that day, you know, I went home. I got home. To Houston and I was crying you know and my mom's like look everything's gonna be okay whether you 
fight again or you don't, that's why I tell you, keep going to school, get your education, learn as much as you can because nobody can ever take that away from you. You know, and then that day taught me that us as athletes, whether you're an athlete, movie star, rapper, singer, whatever, you're only as good as your last fight, your last album, your last movie. You know, in the entertainment business, you're only as good as your, your last performance because of that day that I didn't perf perform that well, man, I'm telling you, when I got to a Paso, I had a limo, I had paparazzi, I had people taking pictures of me. After that night, even though I won, but I didn't do, I didn't exceed expectations, man, I couldn't even get a driver to take me to the, to the, uh, uh to go to the doctor, to the hospital. Wow. The next morning I get up, me and my team, limo ain't there. Mm. Taxi cab ain't there. Hell, man, I don't think they even, the hotel people wanted to take us back yeah, to their But yeah. We had to find our own way. That's real. You know, we had to pay for them. So that day, that day, man, I learned two valuable lessons. Stay in school, get, you know, get as much as I can out of school. And your family are the only people that are going to be with you through thick and thin, man. That's so, a fact. Yeah, that day I learned those two valuable lessons. After that, man, I never told my mother anything about quitting quitting college. I kept going. I graduated. <laughs> I got my degree. Okay. You know? Nice. Uh, yeah, that was that, you know? Okay, okay. Got you, got you, man. That's And that's real, man. Like, that's deep. Like, after all the, when the lights and everything go away, it's like, who's going to be there but your family, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and as soon as, you know, you lose, or like you say, you don't exceed expectations, every, everybody's disappearing now. They go into the other side. Yeah, that's you it. You see it all the time in boxing. Like, yeah, you, you see, see You see guys walking on one side, yeah. and they're like, yeah, hey, and then the other guy wins, and you see him taking pictures like, yeah, hey. well, like, what happened? He's just with this guy. Yeah, absolutely. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely, man. Yeah, that's the way it is. So, you know, I kept, I kept fighting after that. I think that, lesson taught me to keep focused stay dedicated to my to my craft and just do what i had to do and it worked out you know it taught me that those lessons because i was 18 two years later i became a world champion so i'm the second youngest world champion in boxing history to become a world champion. So me and Mike Tyson tied. Mike Tyson, Mike Tyson was 20 <laughs> yeah. when he became a world champion. And I was 20 when I became a world champion. So we, uh, I want to say, you know, maybe I may have a few months that I might have beat Mike Tyson. But, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. we ain't going to sit here and debate a few a few months, you know, especially you go, not with Mike Tyson. You, you go hot boxing and, do, and, yeah. and debate with Mike about that. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you there know you what go. I'm saying? Yep. All so, right, cool. So so you get to the top the, the, the top of, you know, the boxing level champion. You had multiple championships, right? I sure did, Wh yeah. Which ones did you have? Which well, I, I uh, in 2004, I became uh, a champion at the age of 20 with the WBA. And then two years later, I, uh, unified uh, the IBF. I beat Julio Diaz, and then uh, the IBO. I beat Asalino Freitas in, uh, I believe it was in Connecticut. So, man, after that first championship, two years later, I, be, uh, I won my second championship. The third year, I won my third championship, and then I didn't win my fourth because at the time Manny Pacquiao was in the lightweight division, and the other champion that had there's four belts in each weight division right you know so i was trying to conquer all of them but manny pacquiao came and snatched one up and then he he moved up so i didn't get to snatch that that fourth title you know but you know for there was uh i think i was champion for about five or six years okay yeah un undisputed uh undefeated champion and then you know here comes nate campbell man mm. and you know dethrones me <laughs> you know dethrones me so you know you, you have and you can't stay on top forever, man. You can't, man. That's you life. Can't. Yeah, that's life. And and that's where, you know, after my loss, um, I I think I was like forty three and zero with twenty knockouts. I hadn't lost, man. I was on top of the world. But then I was getting the big hit, as well. You know, we athletes, man. If they if there's an athlete or superstar that tells you they don't get a big hit, at some point, man, they're lying. You know, right. you know all the all the tension, all the superstar. No matter how calm and and peaceful you are, it's gonna get to you at one point. You yeah. know, and and it got to me, and I think that uh, that loss, you know, it it set me back, but it also taught me that I need to stay humble and I need to focus on my family 
and my business. At the time, I had no business. Boxing was my business. Right. You know, so then after that loss is when the good part comes in where I started to think outside the box. You know, I started thinking outside the box. My brother and I, we started thinking and we're like, hey, you know, box is not forever. You know, what can we do to better ourselves? So, man, we we tried a car business. Okay. You know, we bought cars. We we're selling cars. Selling cars. Yeah. Then we tried a painting business, you know. Okay. We, painting. <laughs> you know, we construction. Right. We tried construction. We had a little small restaurant. Okay. You know, so. You're ent a real I, entrepreneur. We're entrepreneurs, man. We tried. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. But all of this, we're doing it while we were still boxing. Okay. So, uh, just a little quick uh, um, update on my brother. You know, my brother's Jose Diaz. He's been with me. He's my ride or die partner. 100%. You know, he's been with me. He's from, in the building yeah, right now. Yeah, yeah. He's, What's up, Jose? <laughs> yeah. he's, he's, been, he's been with me from day one. You know, from day one, he's had my back, win or lose, um, up high, up down low, wherever I'm at, man. You know, because I've had some highs, I've had some lows. You know, so it's uh, he's always been there with me. And he was a professional boxer as well. He had 15 fights and one loss. The last, the last loss, the last fight of his career was the loss where they broke his jaw in the first round and he fought. Nine more rounds after that with the broken jaw, mm. you know. So that's heart, baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's so, that heart. <laughs> so he got he got, he got a little bit a little bit of that of that mm -hmm. real power from from my parents. That's a fact. Yeah. So uh, you know, we started thinking outside the box, man. And and I, and when I tell you, none of those visions were successful. None of them were <laughs> successful, man. We uh, you know, because we're young, man. We're we're in college and we're. We don't know how to manage money. We don't really know how to operate a business. So, yeah, we may buy five, six cars, sell them, make double or make, you know, have uh, make some good money. But then what we do, we go and spend that money. And then when we spend that money, we're like, well, how do we buy the next five or six? You right, know, I got to right, pull right. out from my personal right, account, you know. Right. So we don't we don't know nothing about managing business, man. By that time, we're we're 24, 20. 26 years old so we're just thinking man when's our next paycheck gonna come you know from Facts. boxing so it, it took us a little while man it took us a little while and it took us all those businesses to fail in order to jump into what we have now which is jd express okay you know and the way the way i can say we transitioned from from being an at being athletes and being superstars uh to businessmen is after my loss so after my loss in 2008 when Nate Campbell I came back and I uh, on my next fight I uh I fought uh, Michael Katsidis and I beat him for another world title so I became champion right away right off the bat man I lost and then I came, came back. right back I came right back you know so uh so then we started thinking, like, what are we going to do? So, and it's amazing how things sometimes just fall in your lap, man. The trucking business just fell on our lap, you know, because we, uh, we were boxing, we were training, we were doing good, and then we had our, like, off time. You know, after a fight, you have a few weeks that you're off. Right. So then I always liked outdoors. I have go-karts i have four wheelers that my brother and i would go out with our buddies and hang out so i always had a pickup truck with with a uh like a bumper pull trailer okay at, to haul our, our go-karts so then one of my high school buddies calls me i don't answer he calls my brother and he's like hey man uh i'm in a desperate need and i know you guys have a truck and a trailer that that we go out riding motorcycles and four wheelers in right okay and and then he said i need this product i need to ship this material you know from point a to point b so i my brother got he you know he called my brother so my brother like, yeah, yeah i'll help you no worries you know it's, it's our friend man high school uh grade school uh it's like a brother you know so we help him out and my brother goes and picks up the shipment he and he's like you know what don't even you don't i don't even i don't even need the trailer i just need the, the truck the pickup truck so he goes with with my truck that I use for the go karts. Right, it's a regular like pickup, regular truck. pickup truck. Yeah, you know, he's like, here, take this box to over here. 
So point A to point B. Uh, and then my brother goes and does that. And then he calls me like, hey, uh, I just delivered. I just dropped off your box. He's like, all right, now uh, who signed for it? And like, what you mean who signed for it? You know, a POD. What is POD? <laughs> right. Proof of delivery. Now we know, right? right. Now we know. But right. we didn't know any of that, man. So then um, my buddy tells my brother, like, I need proof of delivery. Once you do that, some give me an invoice because I'm going to pay you for it. And then my brother's like, hey, man. Uh, Miguel's his name. Miguel's going to pay me for this shit, man. <laughs> like, you know, i like, damn, for real? How much? i like, what was it like? Uh. Two fifty, three hundred dollars, something like that. For, yeah. Man, for a little box, we're like what? I'm like, <laughs> oh man, hell yeah, this is money right here. Right, you know? that's so, crazy. So you know, that's how it fell on our lap. That is and, so funny. And that's how we got started, man. Right. What? One, just doing a favor, just doing for a, a favor friend for a friend. You you actually ran a business without even knowing it, right? And exactly. then you're like, hold on, this, this you get, get get paid yeah, for this yeah, stuff. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So then we're like, we're like, man, this this could be it right here, you know? So. My brother started, man. I, I, uh, I've always been good with with books. He's always been good with the hustling side of, you know, truck and hustle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he's been good with the hustling side of it. So he's always been out uh, trying to work deals, whether it was with the cars, the restaurant, or the construction. Right. Okay. He was the one always finding the clients, which we would get the clients, and I'm pretty sure the car business would have been successful if we had some kind of business sense. Right. Which at the time we did it, man, we were young, we were making money. So we're like, eh, a little extra money, let's just spend it. So we didn't know how to save and invest and reinvest and, you know, none of that stuff. But he's the one that started driving, started making all these moves. Okay. And then I started reading up on the trucking industry, the trucking business. I'm the one that sat there and applied for all our permits sign all the paperwork that you need to sign in order to get your LLC or your corporation or whatever it is. You get your MC, your DOT, all of that. Yeah. So I started reading up on it. I was still in school. So um, I was like, man, it ain't no big deal. So then we, we kind of grew everything there, man. And even then, and I'll tell you what, for everybody listening, even listening now, it's not that easy. <laughs> like it seems. Yes, it's easy if you got a pickup truck and you're delivering little boxes For all sure. day locally, right? But then we're like, man, you know, we went out there and we bought a, a dually. Okay. With the gooseneck. With doing hot shots. We're like, he, he, that's what our buddy said. He's like, man, if you get a bigger truck with the trailer, then I can pay you more. Right. So we're like, okay, let's do it. Well, hell, man. I didn't even have a CDL at the time. My brother didn't have a CDL. We didn't know nothing about the rules and regulations right. about carrying a log book <laughs> and, you know. And what I, year is this, just to put it in perspective? What, man, what year are we in right now? The, we, oh, we're, we're in uh, two, uh, two, 2012. 2012. 2012, okay, man. okay, gotcha. We're, we're just, you know, picking up and we're like, let's do it. Yeah. You know, so we went out and we bought we uh, bought a truck. This was a used truck, man, a dually. Got a dually. What, How much pay for it? Uh, man, I remember it was like uh, fifteen grand. I fifteen think. grand, yeah. okay. And you got man. a gooseneck trailer, a gooseneck trailer, okay. a used one for like five thousand, I think. And you're still working with your buddy. He's yeah, he's yeah. getting you guys loads. Yeah, yeah. Okay, right, right. So we're doing. My brother's doing the pickup the pickup truck. We're making good money off of that, and then we decided to go bigger. You know, bigger sometimes not better, <laughs> but we're getting paid more money. Yeah. at the time, <clears throat> and then. Uh, we're like, he gives us a load. And granted, man, I'm barely learning. I have no signs on the truck, no nothing. We just pick up the material, we strap it down, and we take off. <laughs> we take off, man. No CDL, no logs, Jesus. no nothing, man. We're like, Shh, man, come on, man. Y'all riding dirty. Yeah, we're riding dirty <laughs> like a mug, man. And uh, so, man, we, we learned a lot because... We started talking to other people. Oh, well, and, and the trip was a total nightmare, man. Right. The truck stopped on us like two or three times. So finally, and at the time, I got good money for my fights. So it keeps stopping on us, man. We're like, man, screw this this crap, you know? we The next time we, we see a dealership, 
we're going to stop there. So we stopped at a dealership, left that old piece of junk there, and bought a brand new truck. You know, a semi truck. A, a dually. A dually. Oh, okay, a dually. A dually. Okay, dually. another dually. Yeah. Another dually. All right. So we left that old piece of garbage there, and we bought a brand new dually, man. So, you know, we go and we deliver that load, and, and, we're basically at a loss now because we bought a brand new truck. You right. know, we're only getting paid. I, I think we're going to Midland or something. We're getting a, a, a thousand dollars or maybe a few thousand dollars. What are you moving? Like a container or something like that? No, no, no. We're doing uh pallets. Pallets, uh, okay. Pallets of uh reamers, I think. Reamers. Okay. Uh something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So uh man, we come back and then we meet up with our uncle. And our uncle's been in the trucking industry for, for all his life. He doesn't own his own trunk, trucking company. He's, he's worked with other trucking companies. But we start telling them everything that we're doing. And, and uh, he's like, man, you boys are lucky. Right. Lucky right. that, you know, we, we didn't get stopped by DOT. Yeah. Well, I mean... No accidents, no, 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 no y'all not behind just, in jail. We didn't even have saying? insurance, man, at the time, you know? But we didn't, man, we didn't know, right. you know? So slowly but surely, we started to pick up our game and we started learning on, uh, on how to do it right, Okay, you know? But this is the thing, man, and this is what I tell everybody, you know, if you're going to start your own business, make sure that you know what you're doing before you step in there. We were young, we were dumb, and it was pretty bad on our, our part, you right. know? But we got through it. We we lived and we learned and we got through it, man. So then, you know, we um we kept doing the business and we we're doing real good. By then we we're managing our money right. We were uh um saving, investing. So we had maybe three, four pickup trucks. No two pickup trucks and two dualies with goosenecks. And then uh, my brother through his construction contacts. All right, Hustle fam, listen, y'all. I am here live on location at OTR Capital. Happy to announce our new strategic partnership with OTR Capital, I'm here with Grace Marr. My friend, how are you, Grace? Awesome, it's so good to have you here. When, when we aligned with somebody, aligned with a brand, we wanted to make sure that we had the right people standing behind us and, and that could help our community and kind of take them further along in their journey because you know we can only bring them so far, right? We need to create those strategic partnerships to take them to the next level. And that's what I think that this relationship and this partnership is gonna do. Grace, tell the people a little bit about OTR and what you guys do. Yeah, thanks, Ramel. So we are a factoring company you know, we've been doing this for 10 years. We're dedicated to trucking companies' success and offering tools and services to help them to continue to succeed. Education is so important to us for our clients and helping them continue to grow their business. I know we have similar missions, you know, um, we really do care about trucking companies and we're both from a trucking background. You know, OTR isn't a financial services company coming off of a bank. We're, you know, we're based out of transportation and third party logistics company and you yourself, you know, ran trucking and had a CDL. So yep. it's like, you know, for us, it's just, it's amazing to be able to come together in this way. The, the, the culture here is awesome. Um, I love working with you guys. I love the people here. And it's great, man. I think we could do some, some beautiful things together, create epic content, add epic value. And I'm really excited and looking forward to doing this with you guys. I mean, it took me a long time to really, you know, partner with someone in this way. And I decided to do it with you guys because I feel that you're the right company to add value to, to our audience. We completely agree. We're super excited, thrilled to be a part of it. Thank you so much. Truck and Hustle OTR, we're now together. We're locked in. Hustle fam, you know we love y'all. If you smell something burning, it's only your desire. Uh, met a construction guy who had a cousin that had a cousin. And you know how that goes, yeah, 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 you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who's, sure. a, who's a dispatcher. Okay. So we met up, we met up with the, with the dispatcher and uh, he convinced us to get bigger, go bigger. And uh, we started to, uh, so we went, skip, skip from getting more pickup trucks, mm -hmm. more hot shot trucks mm -hmm. to straight semis, man. We, I went in there and bought four semis and he, he taught us 
he showed us about the, the intermodal stuff, the container stuff. Yep. And I knew nothing about that, man. By then, I'm practicing. I got my CDL then. Cause right. I, okay. You know, that, now, I know. Right. I know, you know. Right. So, I got my CDL. We start the container business. We start with semis. And, I mean, everything was going good for the f first year. But then after that year, I started to, I started to learn more and more so i started asking questions so the the dispatcher had control of my whole business except the money right you know, i was i knew what was going in what was coming out right so he had full control of the business and when i started asking questions he started to miss days he started not to show up he wasn't answering my calls sometimes so he'll come in every other day and then all of a sudden you know i get a phone call uh from uh from some company that there was a a chassis in atlanta georgia registered under my my company mm. and they had been left there for months so i started questioning him right and and i remember clearly man it's towards the end of the day and he said let me look into that tomorrow and we're gonna figure this out well tomorrow never came he never showed up man so then Man, he was using my company to do his own do stuff. Do his own stuff, yeah. Yeah, so he was, he had other drivers hauling stuff for him under my company. Oh, wow. So, man, that right there, man, is another big lesson that I learned in the trucking industry. The trucking industry is just as cold-blooded as the boxing industry, <laughs> man. I'm telling you, man. Right, I'm telling right. you. It's cutthroat. It, it's cutthroat, man. And uh, so that little incident man between him using my authority to haul containers trailers and whatnot it cost me about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars mm. man about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars and what fines it like fines fees, fees for leaving trailers leave the, uh, the containers, containers the container the, fees the merge yeah all of that man Oof, man i'm Psst. telling you yeah because if you don't return those containers they start billing you like crazy yeah like crazy man <laughs> i think first few days is like 150 per day then yep. it jumps from 150 to 500 yeah yeah and it's like man you look at them raggedy ass containers <laughs> man you're like Shh. they ain't even worked all that money right, you know? right right but they they charge you yes, man they do. so so you know, and on top of that, he had a few accidents that I didn't even know about. Mm. So then I was trying to stay in business. And this was in in uh, 2013 is when I, I started blowing everything up. But before I say that, I say this, man. I was smart enough that when I opened my first company, it was JD Transportation. But then I opened up another company, JD Express, because I knew... I knew that I didn't know the business. So I like, let me open up two companies just, just for the hell of it. Right. You know, <laughs> right. just for the hell of it. At the same time, I opened them up. Yeah. So when all the accidents and all the fees and fines started coming into, into play, um, I started getting all these calls from all these different people about how much money I owed them and, and this and that. I'm like, what the hell? So the accidents and whatnot, at the time I was with Progressive. No, no, actually, no, we had a, a legit uh, trucking insurance company, a trucking company that was doing our insurance. And believe it or not, man, I was getting a hell of a deal. It was like 150 for full coverage and everything, okay. you know, which at the time is just, it's, well, it's a little expensive, but cheap, you know. Right. But um, 150 for full coverage, uh, and and this was per week. So I was maybe like 900 dollars a month per truck, you know, which which I didn't think was that bad at the time to be starting off. Right. You know, and then man, all of a sudden things hit me like like I hit a like a brick wall, man. I started getting all these collection calls. I started to get people wanting money, get paid for loads that I owed them and this and that. So, man, it just went from from good to bad to hell, you know. <laughs> then at, at the end of the day, my, my insurance company dropped me. The only people that would insure me was Progressive. Uh, so at the time, I dropped from maybe 10 trucks to four trucks because... You know, I lost a few trucks. He took with him to another company that I couldn't the dispatcher. even. The dispatcher. I couldn't even get a hold of. So then, by then, man, in order to stay in business with JD Transportation, I had to pay $18,000 a month 
eighteen thousand dollars a month to insure four trucks. Mm. So I didn't even have that much business, right? You know, to to cover the the cost. So I told my brother, you know what? I think this is it, man. I think this is it. We're done, and we closed the doors on JD Transportation. And maybe it was about a month or so that we were in limbo, and we kind of still had customers calling us. And I told him, you know what? Screw it, man. Let's just get back with them. Let's do it ourselves. We don't need nobody. And uh, we did, man. In 2013, we picked up. We rolled up our sleeves and we're like, let's get to work. Wow. You know, I started driving for two years. Okay. I drove for two years. Okay. Uh, containers. My brother was dispatching. Uh, my my uh, best friend was doing the, the payroll and the accounting and all that. So it was the three of us for the next three years, man. We hit it hard. So I had in, in 2012, I had this big old two story building down in McCarty. Well, I mean, for the pe for the Houston people, I know McCarty is like where all the trucks and all the business is. Right. And I had a two story building with a yard space and everything. And I had to get rid of that, man. Um, so we ended up coming over here. And working off of off of uh, here to JD Express, which is now you know Fresno, we had to work from my living room and build back up. Mm. So it took us about, I would say about five years, man, to, to build up. You know, by then it's like 20, 2017, where we started to grow little by little, and it it took us, you know, just rolling up our sleeves, working hard, and me driving. You know, going from boxing <laughs> and being on Showtime, yeah. HBO. Yeah. You know, having uh, the fight of the year in uh, in two thousand eight here where where Marquez. Yep. You know, uh, to making a million dollars in that fight to make not even getting paid <laughs> to haul these to haul my own loads. Right. You know what I mean. Right. So you just gotta do it. Sometimes you gotta do it, and uh, thankfully now you know we go from. Uh, from having to close the doors on my first company, which was JD Transportation, to having 70 trucks now in 2022 with JD Express. Mm. But it just takes hard work. You got to stay dedicated and things are going to happen. Yeah. You're going to have pitfalls, man. No so doubt. I have all the stories, <laughs> man. And if we had a full day, I could tell you how I'm pretty sure some of these drivers know about the, the, Lot lizards, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And, and I'm gonna tell you a funny story, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let, I, let got, I gotta hear this story. Yeah, <laughs> a funny story, man. I was uh, and it's crazy that it happened to me. Let me get a drink of water before I say this, man. Oh God, Ooh. he said the lot lizards. You know this is gonna be an interesting one. Yeah. <laughs> so, I uh, I had this I had this account with uh with Budweiser. Okay. In, in Dallas, the plan in, in Budweiser. So uh, I was driving. I only I spent about two years driving because I, I, I wanted to learn, live and learn the truckers' uh, lifestyle, you right. know, so that I could understand the drivers. So that loading, unloading process, going into the ports, in and out of the ports. So I did, man. I picked up my load going to uh, Fort Worth, the Budweiser plan in Fort Worth. I stopped to, to put gas. It was around... 10 o'clock at night man and then uh you know i i'm like you know what i think i'm just gonna stay here so i, I pay for parking i go and take a shower man i come out and i'm there i'm, I'm i don't think i'm my phone or tv something doing something man and and then uh i uh i pass out but and then keep in mind man i don't have that much experience you know so i don't even lock the doors <laughs> in the truck okay you know next thing you know i'm like i'm laying down i'm I'm like passed out, man. I've been driving all day, so I'm passed out. They see, you know, like wow, I hear, I felt something hit my my body. I get up, I'm like, man, there's this chick, man, on top of me. She's smiling. She don't even have the, her two front teeth. She's like, hey, baby, a hundred dollars, and I'm clean. I'm like. Uh, hell, I'm like get off me I'm like get off me oh my god I'm like get off me I'm like so I just tell her get the F off get away from my truck yeah. leave right now man yeah. I'm like oh my god so after that you know that's an experience that I'll never forget <laughs> it's just, I'm sure it's it's crazy man but you know living that that 
trucker's life. Life, right. Yeah. And I'll tell you right now, if I could do anything in the world, it would be drive. I love driving, man. Love the driving. long distance, the long hauls. I love it, man. It's like you're your own little world, especially at night, driving at night. Yeah. You in the road. I love it, man. I love it. So, you know, and I got plenty of stories like that. I got you. you. Know, in I the got two you. years. But let, let me let me ask you a question. So in, in building back up, because basically the business hit rock bottom with the first business, right, to where it was dissolved completely, right? So you guys had to build from scratch. So at that point, are you still using boxing money to fund that? Or, or is that like you have to like kind of build up again to buy these new trucks like talk about that a little bit well yeah i mean uh at the time you know i had uh my financial advisors they said no they did not want to give me no money they're like no because i have my financial advisors that have my a uh, retirement set up for me and my kids and and so i can't touch that okay i can't touch it, it it's Kind of like what they did is they put my money in a in a safe deposit box. They locked Turned it, the key, swallowed and, it, yep, threw it away, threw it away. Yeah, that's it. You know, so that's for me and my kids when I get older. Okay, if everything else fails, you know what I mean. So they they didn't want, they did not give me any money. So what I did is, uh, I learned the hard way, man. Um, I came up with no money. I made all this money. Then I basically lost whatever money I had that I could touch. I didn't have no money again. Right. So my my advisors had all the money, had all the power. And they're like, nope, you're good. You can live. You can you can have a good life, but you're going to be restricted to a certain amount. Mm. You know, but you're going to have a good life. Just stop everything. Right. But I refuse to do so, man. I refuse to do so. So again, my ride or die, my brother's like, I got you, man. Whatever, whatever you want to do, we'll do it. So we went out, man, with the little trucks that we had. We uh, we started back up, man. We started back up, and it wasn't it wasn't easy, you know. We had to. Uh, my credit score went from eight hundred plus to zero <laughs> yeah. because because all the um, all the trailers that were leased out under my company, but I didn't know nothing about. Right. You know, the, that old dispatcher. And I'm not going to mention no names yeah, really, because yeah, we're yeah. in Houston. And yeah, now nah, you ain't got to do that. Yeah, he still might be dispatching. Now, nah, we keep know, it so, positive. It's all good. Yeah, so, you know, he, I had all this credit that was out there that was being used under my company, which I had to put up my personal credit in order to, from my company, JD Transportation, to get any credit from renting chassis yeah. and uh, trailers and all. Uh, Drive ants and flatbeds and all that stuff. Well, man, so my credit went from like eight eight fifty to like four hundred, man, to right. like four hundred. Right. So then I couldn't even get, I couldn't even rent nothing out. So what we did, man, is we just, you know, we started working with the four trucks that we had. I I started driving, and little by little, man, we started. My brother and I started saving money. He started driving too, you know. So we started saving money and. See, so this is a testament to all the people out there. If you really want to do something, you're gonna do it. Yeah, you know, we cut back on our on our expenses. We started saving some money, and as we the money grew, we bought another truck. Invest back in. Yeah, we invested back. We bought another truck. So we limit we limit. So from 2013 all the way to 2019, it was only three of us. We were doing the invoicing, payroll, driving. You know, paying ourselves and whatever jars we had. So from 2013 to 20, uh, 2019, we grew s real slow. And right. I mean real slow. We went from 2013 to 2015 with about eight drivers. Then from 2015 to 2018, we grew to 20 drivers. And then from 2018 to 2019, we had about 30 drivers. And after that, that's when we hit that boom, you know. In one year, man, we grew 30 drivers. So we went from 30 to 60. Right. From 2019 to 2020. Got you. And then 2021 and 22 is where we added an additional 20 drivers. Got you. Are, are now are you guys buying these trucks outright? Are you financing them? Are they their older trucks? At first? Yeah. At first, we were financing. Okay. Because we couldn't afford to buy them outright. You know? So, and this is something that maybe 
some of these listeners all, uh, all understand or that, that are wanting to, to uh, start their own business. So at first we did, we did finance a few trucks and then I stopped. We stopped making enough money to where we can actually buy them outright. But then instead of buying these newer trucks, <clears throat> we sat by, <clears throat> my brother and I sat back and we're, we analyzed what our business was. So we run nationwide, right? But most of our runs are Texas. So is San Antonio, Austin, McAllen, Dallas. So about 350 to 400 a mile or well, let's let's put it like this: six to eight hundred mile miles round trip, right? You don't need a twenty twenty two truck to make those runs. Right. So what I did is, majority of my trucks are to, from two thousand and six to two thousand and ten Freightliners with Detroit engines. Why? Because a Detroit engine is like having a a Ford engine. You know, anybody can work on it. it goes down the road, it breaks down. Anybody can can work on it. Now, from Houston to Dallas, it's about a 300-mile uh, trip. So if the truck was to break down, it wouldn't cost me that much to go and pick up my truck and bring it back to Houston. Now, if that truck breaks down in New York or California, which, I mean, California is even too, is too old to go in there, right? <laughs> right. But if it breaks down, that's going to cost me some money. You know, so I wouldn't send a 2007 truck to California or New York and expect it to go and come back. Now, it could, it might, but I'm not, you know, so I know my business. I know that I don't need a 2022 or 2018 truck to make these runs to go to Dallas, San Antonio or McAllen. Right. You know, I can have an older truck as long as it's maintained. I mean, you see the mechanic that's here in my yard now. You know, I, I make sure that I maintain I maintain my trucks, do the oil changes, making sure that he goes and inspect it like a level one DOT, DOT officer, officer would. Yep. You know, all of that, man. So I make sure my, my trucks are in tip top shape. So instead of spending seventy, eighty thousand dollars per truck. I'm spending about twenty thousand dollars to buy it, and then another ten to fifteen investing in it, in it, making sure that it's right. So by the end of the day, I have like a I have a thirty thirty five thousand dollar truck that's paid in cash that's making me money. Mm. You know, so now every my goal is every month I buy a new truck, okay. I buy a new truck from the money the profits that the trucks are making me now. So let, let's get it right now. I have, I have 70 trucks under my authority, but 25 of those are company owned. The others are leased on, leased on owner operators. Okay. And the way I'm able to grow that is because I pay the drivers right and I'm fair with them. You know, if they come in and they want to see a, a, a rate, I show it to them, man. It's, and I tell them, that's the first thing I tell them when they, when they come in. And work with me. I tell them, I don't hide nothing from you guys, so I don't expect you guys to hide anything from me. If you want to see how much I'm getting paid, I'll show you. And I'll tell you what your percentage is. Right. You know, but understand that whether you think it's not enough or it's too much, that's your personal opinion. We already talked about the rates because I have to make money to maintain all of JD Express. You yeah. know, I have a family that I need to feed as well. I have a business to run, just like you. Your your business is your truck and your family. So you're fighting for your truck and your family. So whatever rates we discuss, you know, I could show you black and white. I could show you numbers, what it is. Right. But you have to respect that, that I'm giving you my word as a man that I'm going to pay you every Friday and I'm going to be fair with you. You have to respect, you have to give me your word that you're not going to come over here and be, you know, arguing with me about nickels and cents and all that. <laughs> right, right, right. Because some drivers will. Yeah, 100%. Do you, do you think that the intermodal niche is like a, a hidden gem? Because it's, it's something that I know a lot of people are afraid to get into. Uh, it, it's difficult to find drivers to, to work the ports. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it could be a hassle sometimes. You have to kind of understand how to maneuver in and out. I mean, do you advise people to, to get into intermodal? Because I feel like a lot of people get into trucking and they think OTR automatically. Yeah. And they don't think like uh, intermodal where you're local, your guys are getting home every day. Why do you feel that is? Now, man, they, they, they're, 
I don't know if I remember speaking to you on the phone okay. when we previously talked about, but I think, you know, you hit you hit the nail right on the head, man, with with intermodal. You know, and I and I tell people, business people, people that come to me, they're in the past, in 2012, 2013, when I started the business, I went straight to intermodal. It was the cheapest freight ever, man. Nobody really wanted to touch intermodal, but I kept doing it. And I kept telling people, man, this is going to blow up. This is going to blow up. Well, well, guess what, man? During COVID, intermodal did not stop. You know what happened? Instead of shipping out lumber, cars, or just in general goods that that uh, that customers were shipping out from overseas into into the U.S., during COVID, man, we we as a intermodal guys did not stop because it went from shipping all of this general cargo to bringing in hand sanitizer, bringing in toilet paper, bringing in all kinds of uh, goods, man. So it went again. Our business went from zero to a hundred <laughs> real quick, man. And I, yeah, right, right, right. And, and I'm I'm you know quoting one of Drake's songs. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it went it, it went up, it grew, and I think that's where I'm telling you. From 2019 to 20 uh, to 2022, we grew from 30 trucks to 70 trucks mm. because some of these drivers started to see that the only drivers out on the road were container guys. Right. You know, a lot of these OTR uh, full truck loads. I mean, there was nothing to move in the U.S. At, at, besides groceries and and uh, and where were they coming from? You know, after they after they stopped coming from the U.S., they started importing everything, and that's where we, the intermodal guys, went into these sports all over the country, picked up the goods, shipped them to the warehouses, and then the other the other uh, trucking companies would come and pick them up, but. I believe, man, and I say this, just like you, I think intermodal is a hidden gem that not a lot of, not a lot of people have explored or don't even know about. And why? And I'll tell you why. It is hard, man. It is hard. You, there's special permits, licenses, your SCAD code. You got to have uh, special insurance, a trailer interchange agreement with the UIIA in order to work with these ports and it's it's real hard, man, because if you don't know the business, instead of making money, you're going to be spending a lot of money with uh, container demerges, per diems, the trailer uses, the chassis. I mean, you, it could be a real profitable business or you could spend a lot of money. 100%. Do you do inbound and outbound or just? Yeah, you yeah do we both? do imports and exports. Okay. So we, we work with customers uh from all over the world man we we work uh i work with freight forwarders brokers and direct shippers you know we haul what if they can fit in the container we'll, we'll haul it man <laughs> right we'll haul it. right yeah, as long as it's legal for sure <laughs> for sure how, how has uh everything that's going on in politics impacted your business you know with biden and the different things that's going on with russia ukraine um china there's so much things going on globally right has it impacted you at all and how uh my business meant not at all you know uh it i could see how it impacts the oil and gas industry with russia biden and all, all this stuff that's going on all over the world but with containers you know we may be hauling oil and gas equipment uh shipping it overseas or bringing it from overseas but if that slows down there's always customers uh in the like right now i have i have a good customer that's growing tremendously man he's uh he's bringing in granite so slabs of granite from brazil okay so i mean that's just constant constant that has nothing to do with oil and gas <laughs> right you know? right so you know it's it's coming in then i i work with another customer um that's bringing in a lot of seafood shrimp and tilapia from overseas frozen frozen uh tilapia and shrimp that has nothing to do with the oil and gas you know so at times when the oil and gas industry is booming here yes we we see a lot of containers bringing in supplies with oil and gas 
and uh, things of that nature. But when it slows down, man, I go after the shippers and customers that was was booming at the time. So, for example, like hand sanitizers. You know, I started working with a customer that was started bringing in a lot of hand sanitizers, shipping it to Dallas, Texas. So, man, I started working with them. You know, at first I was getting paid real cheap, but then once they see the type of service that I provide, then they start kicking or pushing the other trucking companies to the side mm. and bringing me in. And that's where I'm able to give them premium service, um, charge up a little bit more. And by then they're hooked, you know, so they're hooked. So <laughs> do, do, do customers typically find you or do you get a lot of calls inbound or, or are you having to do a lot of sales out there to find new customers? I, I actually, right now, I'm not doing any more sales. Um, I used to have a, a sales guy. My brother and I used to do sales. But now we, we get so much, so many calls from brokers and freight forwarders, man. And at times... Right now, the industry that we're, I mean, the, the times that we're living in, I'd rather work with uh, reputable brokers and freight forwarders than I do with direct shippers. And let me tell you why. Because a direct shipper or a customer, once you start the relationship with them, they, you know, they tend to say, you know what, let me have an extra 10 days. So instead of 30, let me pay you in 40. Let me pay you in 60. You know, so they they have that that comfort with you that they can reach out to you and and tell you, hey, give me a little bit of time or extend my my line of credit a little bit more. And, you know, in the trucking industry, man, I mean, you know, nickels and dimes and pennies is everything. You know, it can <laughs> right. make you or break you, you right. know, especially with the fuel prices going up. So I'd rather deal with these freight brokers or freight shippers because you, know, you tell them. I'll do the work for you, but net 30, and this is how much it's going to cost you. And if you want me to do it, I need a rate con, you know, signed and stamped, and we'll make it happen. Yeah. And so they have to abide by the by those by those rules, by those terms, you know. And, and on top of that, some of these brokers, they're a lot bigger than some of these direct customers. So they have the capital, they have the money to pay you in 30 days, and they have the ability to wait those extra 15, 20 days to get paid. You don't use factoring? I don't use factoring. Okay, okay. Cool. I used to. You, okay. I used to. So you just, you're just waiting it out, those I, net, I, net 15, net 30, whatever Yeah, yeah man, I, I try to negotiate with, with, my, uh, with my customers, you know, net, net 15, net 30, which I have a huge customer, man, that, you know, I'm considering it because it's all about cash flow. Right, you know, cash flow, and and the way I I see I used to see it is why am I gonna you know give up that money when when I can when I can keep it myself? But then it also doesn't make sense at times. You know that money that's coming in, I can use it to make more money. You right. Know? If that, if that would be why you would use right, factor. Right, right, right. So if the factoring rates are low enough that benefit. Uh, benefit your business then why not do it you yeah know? why yeah. not do it 100 so, yeah. and you also have a flatbed division as well right i do yep i do my, my brother your actually brother works that. a flatbed yeah. so are you guys on a load load board with those or you have direct uh shippers with that as well we have direct direct uh shippers direct customers okay that uh they do oil and gas okay we uh they drill man they do uh uh hor horizontal direction directional drilling Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, man, we we ship out um all over the country. And those are primarily primarily uh the high shots that are we're taking drill bits, uh mud motors, that kind of stuff. And then for the big stuff, we do uh uh sandblasting material uh that we ship out to West Texas and primarily in Texas. Got you. So, the last question on Intermodal, how does some because you said you had the big boom in last year like during covid and all that like 2019 what, 20, 2019 yeah, yeah, yeah. so what was the 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 main cause of that big boom like what happened for you was it more customers or more freight from the customers you had what was the key that turned you guys up so much from almost doubling in your business size man it was the fact that it was so many customers reaching out to us and then the prices 
damn near doubled, man, for container work. Right. You know, like when when we used to charge two to three dollars a mile, we're over here charging five and six dollars a mile. And which we still are, you know, for some of these runs. And because container intermodal containers are a special niche that not everybody gets into. So you can't just call up uh, you know, Joe Blow Trucking Company and say, right. Hey, I have a container at the Port of Houston or New New York or wherever it may be, and I, I need I need it picked up and delivered to my warehouse. Not everybody can do that. Right. You know, we on the other hand, or anybody that's a, a trucking company intermodal trucking company, they can go into we can go into any port, you know, and pick up a container. Of course we have to sign up and, and get our, our permits to go in there, right? right? But we know the 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 process how to do it you know because if it's it's not all the same but it's pretty similar gotcha. you know in every port so any customer if we have the equipment like we have reefers we have dry vans we have flat bits so if any customer calls us and ask hey i need a driving load a full load a full truck load i need a reefer i need a dry van i need a hot shot we can do it Got you. If they need uh, us to move a container from the Port of Houston, we can do it. You know, you can't just call up any trucking company. That's a fact. And, and tell them, hey, can you move a container from us? So by us having that container authority, being able to go in and out of the ports, that gives us fe flexibility and the ability to do everything else. 100%. I, I'll tell you, I, I know several people in your niche in Intermodal, and there's a lot of trucking companies struggling right now. Yep. But Intermodal is not. It's booming, man. It's moving. <laughs> it's, yeah, booming. it's booming. It's booming and right there's now. Work for, and there's work for everybody to do it. You know, if anybody comes and asks me, and I've had drivers that want to start their own container business, and I'll tell them, look, man, it honestly cost me $250,000 for me to learn this business 10 years ago, you know, am I going to hold your hand and tell you step by step by step what to do? Hell no. <laughs> but am I going to point you in the right direction? Yes, I am. Right. Because I'm not that type of guy. You know? Right. There's enough for everybody, all of us to eat, you yeah. know. So can I tell you who can help you with your scackle? Yes. You know, they're going to charge you, but I'll point you in the right direction. This is where you get your scackle. Call this person. You know, you got to get your, uh, whatever you need, I can guide you in the, in the right direction. Yeah. You know, your authority, your DOT, your MC number, your SCAT code, you know, trailer interchange agreement, all of that. I can point you in the right direction, but I'm not going to sit there and hold your hand and <laughs> give you the, you know, when it costs you $250,000. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. What's next for JD Express, man? What's the next, <laughs> next year look like next two years or so? What do you, what do you, what are you, what are you looking to do? Well, man, like I told one of my my buddies, you know, I, uh, a few years ago, I told him, "I'm JD Express is gonna become the next baby bull of trucking." Okay, you know what Juan Baby Bull Diaz was in the boxing industry. That's what JD Express is gonna be in the trucking world, man. It's gonna be the next baby bull of trucking. I love you that. know. So if it means doubling in size next year, triple in size. Whatever that is, or if it means staying the same, but being a major player for some of these major customers, then if that's what it means at, with 70 trucks, then that's where we're going to be. You know, we're going to be the best that we can with what we have here in in Houston, Texas. No doubt. And you're currently looking for guys, right? You're, you're still looking to bring more guys on? Or? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So how, how, does somebody, how does somebody do that if they want to connect with you in that way? Well, if somebody wants to connect with us, and I'll, I'll give you guys the, uh, the number, the okay. office number is 877-630-5449, or you can always uh, hit me up on social media and look up uh, Juan Diaz, you'll see a, a picture of, of me with my belt on top of a truck, man. With the belt. Championship belt on top of a truck. You <laughs> Where's know? the belt at, man? We should have had the belt. So yeah, we should have brought the belt. The belt <laughs> oh, man, that's dope, man. Listen, this this has been super dope, super dope conversation. I think we've been going for like two hours now or so. At, at, I, 
hour 30 i think so right man damn <laughs> it, it, I, it feels like that I, I get to i get to talking man and, and i know I'm, I'm i'm all over the place nah now nah, you good you know bro. i i feel like hell man uh hour and a half two hours you know to kind of uh it's basically like i live two lives yeah you know 100 the, the athlete side and then the business side yeah you know which and life has been more fulfilling for you more fulfilling man i i'm gonna have to say the business side the trucking side believe it or not why believe it or not man because because you at the, the top you got to yeah, the top of yeah, boxing because in boxing it was all dependent on me you know whether i wanted to get up and run whether i wanted to eat right whether i decided to go and spar 10 15 rounds that day it was all up to me you know when when they when they put my gloves on and i was facing my opponent it was just me and him you know so i knew what i was gonna do a lot of times i didn't know the outcome of it <laughs> but i knew that i was gonna put my 100 percent in it but the beauty about the trucking company is that when I, well let me go back when i would would win that that championship fight or that fight it was just me i felt that satisfaction i felt that glory you know nobody else could feel what i felt but in the trucking industry man when that guy calls me and he's like hey man uh you know like man my my wife is really sick you know and i could show you the paperwork i'm gonna need a little extra cash this week you know could you kind of help me and give me the best runs Man, I go out there and I talk to the dispatchers and I tell them, hey, make sure you run this guy hard, legally, but hard, and give him the best loads, you know? And then when I get a phone call a month later, not from him, but from his son, man, saying, you know, thank you, Mr. Diaz. Thank you for giving us that little extra, for helping my mom push through these uh through through this uh therapy you know come to find out man she's doing like uh chemotherapy you know and they needed that extra cash yeah. you know and that's when that's when you know it's so rewarding man that you you're not i'm not just changing my life i'm helping other change other people's lives you know what i mean so when as an athlete yes i i gave entertainment i was entertaining but now I'm helping out people, you know. I'm helping people change their lives. I'm bettering their lives. Not because, you know, that's what I do, but it just, it it comes from my heart to help other people, you know. And that is the most rewarding thing I could ever have, you mm. know. Nobody, nobody applauds me for it. Nobody sees it, but I know it, you right. know. Just like just like when I when I became a world champion for the first time, nobody felt that excitement, that glory that I felt. Well, I get the same glory, the same excitement, the same satisfaction by helping people, man, come up, helping people uh better their lives, better their families' lives, you know? And but I say that to say this, not every every person, every driver is as thankful as the next guy you know right. i've i've done man i've had drivers leave on me they owe me 15 20 grand you know i've i have a few guys do that but just because the last driver did it doesn't mean i'm not gonna help the other driver the next driver that comes and asks me for help no man this, we're all humans we all make mistakes we're all different you know now am i gonna let them borrow give them a fifteen thousand dollar <laughs> check and tell you you know right you, you're, not a, you're not a fool either. Nah, i'm not a fool either uh, right you know right but but yeah just because one guy does something does me wrong man doesn't mean i'm not gonna help the next guy you yeah. know it's, it's part of life you live and you learn and you grow yeah you grow but to answer your question the trucking business is much more rewarding than my championship days. A hundred percent. I love that. All right, cool. So 
it's customary that we always have to give a final thought and you've been dropping jewels the whole episode <laughs> but the final thought is basically what you want to leave the audience with right that entrepreneurial thought or spiritual or wherever you want to go with it and then just one more time let everybody know where they can connect with you personally learn more about JD Express learn more about you um, so forth and so on so let's go with the final well let's go where they connect with you, connect with you first and then let's leave them off with the final thought yeah so uh you know, you can find me, you can contact me at 877-630-5449. That's the JD Express number. Or you can uh, reach me on my social media at Juan Diaz. I don't have no special nicknames, no special <laughs> name. It's just Juan Diaz. Look for the guy with the championship belt on top of a, a semi. That's right. Yeah, that's how you can find me. And final thought, man, is uh, what I used to tell uh, kids. You know, at times I was a motivational speaker when I was a world champion. I would go to high schools, uh, elementary schools, and try to motivate these kids. So whether you're uh, a little kid, little girl, or you're a full-grown adult and you want to make changes in your life, you know, it doesn't matter what age you are. It, it's always good to have a dream. You know, have a dream. Have a dream. Chase that dream. Work hard for their dream and never give up. And if you do those things, I guarantee you, you're going to have a fulfilling life, whether you're eight years old or whether you're 60 years old. <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter what age. If you have a dream and you follow that dream, you work hard for that dream. I'm telling you, man, you're going to have you're going to find that happiness and that success, that fulfillment in your life that like no other man. So it's always, you know, it's always good to dream and have a dream. No doubt. The champ is here. <laughs> Juan, baby bull, Diaz. We about to go a couple rounds after this, y'all. Listen, this has been a super dope podcast. Thank you so much for joining me, my brother. Listen, Hustle Fam, if you can't respect it, your whole perspective is whack. You know what we do around this time. If you smell something burning, it's only a desire. Myself, the champ, we out. If you twisted, confused, or stuck about trucks, don't be dumb. This is the place to come. Truck and hustle. Let's go.